What's up, guys? My name is The Cherno. Welcome back to Game Engine Series, Cherno Livestream. Everything, all of the above. How's everyone doing? We're gonna have a nice, chill episode today because. Because. We're kind of at a crossroads at the moment, right? <laughs> Vague Lobster, thank you for two and a half years. Yeah, that's amazing. Really appreciate the support. This guy looks like he computers. Yes, I do computer every now and then. Oh yeah, I do actually have a bunch of computers. I never clean like everything. So I've just got just random stuff here. I should probably try and like make more of a set. Actually, if you guys aren't careful, you're gonna wind up with me like being one of those streamers that have like a green screen. I'll have like a green screen behind me and then you guys won't see anything. It'll just be all just me. Just me and some fake background. Is that what you want? Um, so today, I mean, let's take a look at the roadmap because the roadmap is, is always good to look at. Um, because this is a project that I only ever really think about once a week. Uh, and that is during these live streams. So it's always good to look at the roadmap to first of all, see what on earth is going on. And then for the people watching on YouTube and who aren't paying as much attention as I am, it kind of catches up. It catches you up with what we're doing. So, I mean, what's this? Backlog stuff, joints, constraints, okay, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, we're basically done with C-sharp, right? Like, uh, with, like, Mark 1 of C-sharp, right? With, like, our very first kind of, like, our very first pass through C-sharp, minimum vi viable product, first vertical slice, all of those terms. We're kind of done. We can technically use C-sharp to make games. And that's kind of where I really want to move on to first game. So what we're actually going to do... Hey, Electron Diffuser, what's up? Haven't heard from you in a while. How's it going? Um, what we're going to do today, really, is we're going to... Uh, we're not going to start on the game. I want us to start on the game next week, right? So next week, during our regular stream time... What date is that? It looks like the 21st. Okay, so next week, during this regular stream time, we're going to basically start planning, like, working on a game inside Hazel 2D, which is going to be very exciting. Uh, so make sure you guys, like, over the week, just think about think about what game we should make here. Because I don't really know. It's probably going to end up being, like, some kind of 2D platformer or something like that. I don't know. Maybe it can be, like, a 2D top-down game. I don't really care. The purpose of us doing this is just so that we can kind of flesh out the the C Sharp a API and make sure we have something that more or less works, right? Because after that, we're going to probably move on to Vulcan. I mean, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I do want to get Vulcan in relatively quickly. Like, before we work on more rendering things. But we also can do, like, an asset system first and maybe even, like, um, packaging or whatever. Because what I'm thinking is, if we go down that route instead... It means that we can theoretically, like, ship this game, right? Uh, even though it's not... Like, I'm not going to obviously spend, like, a year working on this game. It's going to be a quick one. But it still might be cool to just actually ship something small, you know, with this engine. And if it obviously supports OpenGL, which it does, we can just use that for rendering. Uh, and then we can flesh out some of the other systems. I mean, we probably need to add audio as well, to be fair. And we may want to explore, like, other platform support. But see, for example, like... I don't know if I want to... We might have to switch to something else other than OpenGL for that. But anyway. Oh, what did I just do? I don't know what I just did. Whatever. Uh, so, yeah. Like, I mean... It's kind of like... There's a few different ways that we could kind of na navigate this and, and get through this work. Um, but that that's an idea, right? So, anyway. The, ne the next really big thing we're going to work on is the game. So, what I want to do today is I basically want to just go through everything we've done and clean it up a little bit and make sure we're ready to actually begin working on uh, the game. And what's that, what that's going to involve as well is we're actually going to merge this back into the master branch. So at the moment on GitHub, where we have our project, um, master is like four months old-ish. 
I think. July 12th was like the last commit. Um, we're on the scripting branch. And that's what we've been like two weeks ago when we had the last episode is when we last committed to this, which was C-sharp debugging. Um, you know, at this point, like we should basically merge scripting back into master uh, and then just delete the scripting branch and then we can start on the game. Because I, I definitely don't want to make the game like in the scripting branch. Like I want to kind of make it in master. I mean, I don't know if I'll make the game itself in master. I'll probably commit it to a separate repository. I mean, projects. Projects we probably should set up before we start making a game, though. Maybe that's something we should add. Um, we probably should. That's a good point. Uh, let's just do, like, project system. And teen to gay. <laughs> Thank you for the prime sub. Appreciate the support. Sorry, I have no idea how to read your name. Um, yeah, I think I kind of want to do project system before we do the game, right? So, uh, create, create projects, projects. Let's just do that. And then we'll add like a little to do. So, um, So basically, like, that's kind of what we should do. This is obviously using UI as well. Um, the reason is, like, the, the, it's not really that difficult to set this up. Like, really the only thing that this needs to be able to do is, like, store project-specific data in the project file, right? So we need to have projects so that we can, like, basically, ha like, have a context for many project like, specific things, right? So, for example, what c -sharp DLL do you want to load? Where are, I, where are your assets? That kind of stuff, right? For that, we really do need some kind of, like, project structure so that we can differentiate between what might be, like, a sandbox project and what might be, like, a game that I'm working on, obviously. Like, we need that system. So, I think I want to do that before we actually start doing the game. Um, and, like, to be fair, like, we could smash that out right now. Um, I don't think I want to, though. So let's do this next time. I'm going to add a little uh, 21 slash 11, which is just going to mean 20, 21st of November. Sorry for you Americans who write your month first. But 21st of November is when I'm kind of scheduling that. Um, and then, actually, this might be good because I'm going away for a while. So I'll be gone. Yeah, so like 21st of November, we'll do the project system. 28th, I'll be gone. And then 5th of December... We can start this, right? So I'm actually adding da adding dates to this because I'm serious about this. So today then, so we'll do this next week. Today then, let's actually go through scripting, make sure we've got everything and we'll merge back to master. So merge into master, right? So this is what we're going to do today. Um, yeah, sound good? I'm excited to get this stuff done, because once we merge it back into master, that basically means it's done. But for that to work, we also have to make sure that um, things do generally work, right? So this is just going to be a cleanup episode, but also I want to make sure that we kind of QA this a little bit uh, and make sure that like we can, you know, not crash in any circumstance, basically, or any, like, you know, I'm sure there will be bugs, <laughs> but it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's still kind of... We, we still need to test it as much as we can. So, going through this, I mean, if we think about what, what what we've actually changed, and when we do the merge, we can actually see a diff between the two branches if we want to, and that way we can obviously see uh, if there's anything that, like, you know, we can go through that, basically. It's almost like a big kind of... It's almost like a, like a code review at that point. It's like a little merge, merge pull request that someone's, like, submitted, and then we'll go through, and we can kind of... Uh, validate all of that. And actually, I guess we can do that today. But before we do that, I just want to go through this and actually make sure that um, this code is relatively clean. Because if we look at this, like script glue and script engine, I mean, everything in the scripting uh, folder, that's the majority of what we've done. I mean, obviously, we've done other stuff. Like, for example, uh, I think as part of this, if we go back to GitHub real quick, I think as part of this, because we've done, it looks like we've done 12 commits here. 
um, in the C-sharp branch, right? So basically, like, and we can see the diff here as well, but you can see that it's not just like the um, initial C-sharp uh, engine work, internal calls or scripting work, but see, then we, we also did other stuff like, uh, this is all script, scripts related, um, while watching, yeah, like pausing and stepping, for example, has nothing to do with scripting, right? That's just us being able to pause the runtime and also step like frame by frame. Um, so, but I, I guess aside from that, everything else is pretty much related to scripting. So there's actually not much other stuff that we've done, I guess. Um, and you can see we can actually merge this uh, automatically because <laughs> there's actually no difference. Like, I don't think master has a, has a single commit that's gone into it what, like since we diverged into script into scripting, so like obviously that's kind of fine, um, because what we've really like done here is like if this is like the master branch, and then this is like the scripting branch, what we've done is we've been on master, and then we've kind of branched off into scripting. And we have like all of our commits, right? And then like, that's it. Like master does not have, you know, any of its own stuff at all. It's like exactly the same as this. And so therefore when we merge back, it's almost gonna look like we didn't even branch off ever. Like we just always stayed on master and committed this stuff. But the reason obviously that I made the branch is because we wanted to keep master stable because that's like our release branch. And then we want to do all of our kind of dodgy work that is work in progress uh, inside this kind of separate scripting branch. So that's that. Um, but again, before we begin the merge, which again, should be very easy because you can see that it's just, it's it's not really a merge. There's nothing to merge. It's just basically setting master to be scripting uh, in a way. So, <clears throat> but before we do that, I just want to go through everything. And again, like everything in this kind of scripting, uh, in case you guys can't see it, uh, everything inside this scripting folder, like we've kind of added these files. They're completely new in the scripting branch. So that's kind of what I'm primarily going to focus on. So if we go through, um, and then like what I'm kind of looking for here really is code. Like I, we've tested this reasonably well so far. Like I don't think there's any major problems. I think the only thing I can think of is that if you try and if you actually like, if you make changes to the assembly while the scene is in play mode and you build it again, triggering a reload that will crash. Um, which we can just disable like, as in we can just be like, Hey, you know, if you detect a reload, like as in if the file watcher detects the change, the file has been modified, but we're in play mode, just cue that reload for when you stop. Um, so that it doesn't do it during runtime and then cause a crash. And then eventually if we really wanted to, we could make it probably work in play mode, but that might be a little bit complicated because it depends what you've changed in the assembly. Because if you've changed a lot, then, then, you know, like what happens if you completely got rid of an entity script? Like the engine's gonna have to respond to that. So it's a bit of a slightly bigger feature. But anyway, so looking at this, this is script engine.cpp, uh, like this stuff, right? We've got to do's here. By the way, another thing we could do um, is we could just do like a search. So if I just do control shift F, right? We get this little guy. Uh, if I go to, to this folder, I don't know if there's an easier way to do this, but basically you can just in the look in, instead of it being entire solution, you can just paste in the path and then you can search for like stuff and it's only going to search for it in this folder. So if I wanted to search for to do, I can quickly do that and then see that, oh look, I've got like exactly one to do. It's actually this one that we're looking at, but that's just a little, little hot tip for you guys. So move to file system class. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't really want this read bytes to be here. I also probably want to introduce a buffer class because if we look at this, right? So what I don't like about this, um, there's nothing like, I mean, it's a very primal kind of, uh, <laughs> it's a very primal kind of, um, function in the sense that it returns a char pointer, right? Which is just a pointer to memory, right? It can be anything, can be a void pointer. The reason why we specifically make it a char pointer is because a char is one byte in size, right? 
And so if it if it if the size is one byte, it just lets us easily kind of, you know, do things to it. So like for example, if we want to add a byte, we can just do plus one. If we want like the size, I mean the size we uh, send out separately, but <clears throat> Having it as a char pointer just kind of keeps it one byte. That's why we kind of use char. We can use unsigned char as well. There's no real difference. Again, depends on if you how you use it, but char is is a fine choice. Uh, and then obviously we have a separate size because we don't know the size. Um, so that's kind of annoying, right? Because we have to return char pointer, but then this has to be an additional thing we specify. And then we have to like kind of, you know, we have to kind of like keep track of both of these things. So you can see that when we actually use this function, right, we have to make this additional variable out here and then have file data and file size. Like why are these not grouped together in some way? Now there are many, many things we could do to fix that, right? Like for example, we could change this to actually return a vector of chars instead, right? And if we make it a vector of chars, then what we can do is when it's time to like allocate, um, so where's like, uh, so buffer we make it so we make the buffer here, right? We can just make a vector instead a vector of chars, right? These this is our buffer and then we can just Initialize it with that size right and then it will automatically heap allocate like that much memory and then we can you know just do buffer Dot data and then obviously we instead of keeping track of size or whatever. I mean we actually read the size here but um we don't need to kind of use that anymore because we can just obviously the vector itself stores size as well thanks for the sub gift crowds 4k um yeah the i'm drawing on the screen using a thing called zoom it as someone pointed out as nan nanano pointed out <laughs> you guys and your weird names anyway um yeah so that that's totally doable like i don't mind that um the big issue with this though and the reason why i ultimately don't usually use vectors like this in my own code is because what happens is when you copy a vector it copies the vector right like if i want to copy that because i want to pass it into another function or i'm returning it or like i'm whatever right if i just kind of treat this as a value type then what's going to happen is it's obviously going to copy the memory, right? If I have my results over here and I, you know, set it equal to buffer like that, that's going to do basically what we call a deep copy because it's going to copy that buffer of memory internally into this and it's going to give us two different buffers. Now, of course, we could move it, right? We could use like the move thing, right? I don't know if you can do it using the assign operator, but... You can probably do something like that and then it will like move it or whatever and then it will call the move constructor and the point of that is that it will steal the memory instead of reallocating it and copying it but still like the semantics of a vector are a little bit different so what i like to do is i like to make a class and this is what i this is what we use in big hazel as well and i make a class and it's called buffer and what this is, is basically um, a little wrapper just around, a, around an allocation, right? Or not even an allocation, really. It's a buffer. It's a non-owning buffer. It's a non-owning class. <laughs> it's a non-owning buffer, we'll say. Um, and I can, usually I just make it a struct. Uh, that, yeah, it basically doesn't own the memory at all, but it references it and it stores its size as well. So... Typically, I just use a UN8T by default, and we can have this kind of pointer here, and that's called data. That's our data. And then we have a UNT64T, which is our size, right? Which is zero by default. Um, I, I don't know if we need to... Will we have any other functions? What are the int types that? I don't know, whatever. Anyway, that's basically what the buffer is. Uh, and so the idea is obviously like we pair these two together, but also you'll notice like when I kind of use this, like if I write a copy constructor for this, I'm actually not going to write a copy constructor for this, or maybe I will, but it's going to be default, right? So we just do a shallow copy of this because the whole point is this is not owning, right? Non-owning means two things. It means that when you copy, 
you don't copy, right? So I'm not going to do a deep copy, meaning I'm not going to actually copy the data at this pointer, at this memory address. I'm not going to do what's called a deep copy, right? I'm not going to allocate a whole new buffer for myself and then copy all the memory across from the, you know, from the source object of my copy. And then the second thing is in the destructor, yeah, I'm not going to delete data, right? That doesn't happen because I don't own the data, therefore I can't delete it. So that's kind of what the buffer class is used for. Whereas obviously if you, like if a vector goes out of scope, then of course it calls a destructor. And of course that will like free the memory allocation, which is actually not what we want here. Why? Because we want it to kind of manually be released. And speaking of which, we need a function called release so that we can delete uh, data and we're also going to set data to null pointer and we're also going to set size to zero right now you could argue you don't need these two operations the reason why I do this is because you might reuse it and it's just good to like this isn't really going to be a huge performance overhead or anything and it's just going to mean that we actually um, you know won't if we call release again it won't do anything instead of crashing because we're trying to release a pointer that's already been released um, yeah, and that's kind of it. And we can add so much API here. Like I think the buffer class in Hazel is, a is like a couple hundred lines of code. Like there's a lot of stuff here that you can do and I'll show you some of it right now. Um, but that's kind of what I like to do just to handle raw buffers basically. So this is like a raw buffer of memory and, and specifically it's not owning. So non-owning raw buffer class and it's a struct biggest lie ever um anyway we might expand on the documentation later so uh how do we make this thing well we can have a default this uh constructor which will do absolutely nothing and then i think we can probably like have a constructor that will allocate right so I could make one of these guys, and so that's gonna store size, and then it's gonna do, uh, maybe we can just do, how about we just do allocate size, right? Because I also want allocate to be a function, and I mean, we could probably, yeah, okay. So allocate, void allocate. So data equals new uint ht. So see, this is another good example of why we want to use uh, kind of one byte types. If we had a uint 32t uh, 32 here for data or like an int or something, then obviously when you allocate a new int and you do size, that's going to be size times four bytes, right? Because an integer is four bytes. And this is kind of like in terms of elements, not in terms of bytes. So we kind of like to keep things in one byte types like this when we're dealing with buffers usually so that like the element count and everything specifically uh, kind of corresponds with the size in bytes. And then we'll also set size to size. All right, um, so that will just allocate that. And then we can call this function anytime to do that. Now, here's the thing. What if we call that again, right? Well, we want to release first. So this is getting a little bit like, this is where you really need to draw the line on how to use this class properly. I'm going to go with like an ultra safe thing like a, an ultra kind of safe way here. Like I don't want to take any chances in terms of like memory leaks and everything. So what I'm what I'm saying is that every time you call the allocate, allocate function, it will in it will in fact release, right? So if we look at what happens in the beginning, let's say we call the constructor with a size of four, we want to allocate four bytes. Then what's going to happen is it's going to call like this gets initialized to null pointer and to zero. Allocate gets called, release gets called, it deletes this which is null so it does nothing says it to null says it to zero right so it's a little bit redundant but it's also something the compiler will probably clean up a little bit um and then what do we do we do the allocation we do the size so it's a little bit redundant in the, in the sense that by the time we actually get to this allocation we've initialized these guys twice basically once in the constructor over here when we've done this and then again, you know, when we've released it. So again, because of that, like, I don't know if I necessarily want to go down this road. Um, it depends, like, because obviously what we could do is we could easily just say, okay, how about we just do data equals new in, new un 8t, um, you know, size, and then size, 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 right? And then if we, if we do that, then how many times do we initialize these guys? Once 
right? We don't do it essentially three times. Twice with this, yeah, and then once with this. So it's up to you how you play this. I would say that from a code-like point of view, and you know, if we want to be clean, then obviously calling this is better in the sense that now we're not allocating in two places in our code, right? Here and here. We're actually just allocating in a single place in the allocate function. So if we want to see like, oh, what happens with the buffer? When does it allocate? We can put a breakpoint here. My point is all the code obviously flows through one function. That's a lot better. So this is a bit of a trade-off between, I guess, theoretical performance and like wasted cycles and... Um, how clean you want your code. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I am actually going to do it this way, right? I am just going to call allocate. It's just going to be, it's just going to be easier. Um, and I don't think uh, it'll, it'll, I don't think it'll be too detrimental to the performance. Okay. Um, right. So we basically have a good baseline here. Of course, if we want access to data, this is a struct, so this is all public. So we can just access the data easy, right? We don't need to make any getters, any setters, nothing like that at all. Uh, of course, you should call these convenience functions rather than like accessing this stuff directly, but yeah. Um, now, here's a really, uh, <clears throat> here's a really um, good kind of uh, use case here. Like, what if we want to access this, this, but we don't want it to be a U and AT, right? Because I've specifically said data is U and AT, right? But what if like we want it, what if it's what if this is actually a buffer of floats or a vector or something? We'd have to kind of get this and cast it to like a different type, right? But instead of doing that, what we can do is we can actually write ourselves a nice little easy convenience function um, that's templated, right? So type name T. Uh, and this will just return at whatever we want, basically, and we can just call this as, right? Now we can add like a little const here and return a const version. Uh, it's up to you. I, buffers don't really, I don't usually make buffers const because we basically always pass them by value anyway. Um, so I'm not gonna bother with like a const version, but basically what this will do is it'll just cast data to whatever type we want, right? So this is just a little convenience function to just make it so that we don't have to cast it. We can just access it as any type we want really. Uh, okay. And then, yeah, I mean, you could have like, other functions here, like one that we actually have in Hazel, which we use quite a lot, is um, we actually do, we actually have a static kind of constructor situation where it's kind of like a, a static buffer, uh, and we call it copy. And so this will actually um, take in an existing uh, buffer, right? And it will copy. So in other words, it'll make a new buffer with the same size as the other buffer and then it can just do a mem copy into result.data from other data and like in other dot size or whatever right so this is just a, a, a nice easy way for us to copy from another buffer if we so want that mem copy is undefined where is all this stuff um mem copy like this probably no. Where's mem copy at? Ah, uh, oh. standard IO, really? Or is that just being weird? Let's see. Well, this is saying it's in C string. Interesting, sure. All right. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, um, and that can just copy an existing buffer. So in other words, the copy constructor does nothing. It does like a shallow copy. So it'll copy the pointer value, not the actual pointer data. And just like it'll copy the memory address itself uh, and the size, right? But it won't actually do a deep copy like this. Like you have to explicitly call copy if you want that to be done basically. Um, anyway, like we could flesh out this API even more. Obviously there's much more stuff to add if you so desire. I'm not gonna bother with that. Instead, if we go back to here, let's convert this to use our buffer class. So we don't longer need an outsize, right? Because now that's stored inside the buffer. Let's go ahead and include uh, Hazel core buffer. 
Um, now, what do we do if we fail to open the file? Instead of null pointer, we can just return like a blank buffer. So remember, we have a constructor. Sorry, we have a, uh, yeah, we have a default constructor over here, which will just obviously initialize the members with these values, null pointer and zero. So speaking of which, it would be nice, you know, because obviously like read bytes, I think we check later to see if file data is not null. I mean, actually we're not over here. Um, uh, yeah, we actually don't check anyway. But basically if we like, obviously if this return null pointer, we have the ability to check to see if it actually successfully read the file or not, because that's a pointer. And if it's null, then if zero is gonna not go into that branch, right? So we can check that. So we wanna kind of retain that functionality. So what we can do is actually add like a operator I think it's just operator bool, like that, um, const, and then like const because it doesn't need to, to be modifying. And basically what this can do is it can basically, I don't know, you can do whatever you want, like return data or size, cause they should be, you know, they should both be zero or null. But basically if you just do this, then it means that now what we can do is we can return like just a new empty buffer, which you can write either like this, or if you wanted to, you could you could write it like that. It's up to you. I think I usually write it like that just because it kind of looks more empty. <laughs> um, but it does the same thing. It'll call the default constructor. Uh, and then what that means is uh, if we actually take in a buffer here, so we no longer need this file size anymore, right? That can go away this could go away, we just do that, then we can still do that, right? Because we've added that bool operator. If we didn't have that, then you can see that obviously doesn't work because you can't convert a buffer into a bool, but you can if you add an operator, okay? Or, or like specifically the bool operator. So that's an important little addition because it lets us kind of have like that kind of null state and still retain that functionality, which is good. Okay. So what happens over here? Um, so we used to do buffer equals new char. So instead we can do, uh, well, the same thing really. It's just that it's going to be like written like this, right? So we create a new buffer of a particular size. Um, if we want to read in, we just do dot data, right? And then size, we can use either size or dot size or whatever. So here we have a little problem, right? So read actually wants a char pointer, right? It doesn't want a U in 8T which is an unsigned char. So what we can actually do is instead of doing buffer.data, we can just do buffer as char, right? And that's just gonna cast it into the right format for us. Now, the alternative obviously is you can still do dot .data and just make this a char. <coughs> this is like one character more, I think. Like it doesn't really matter. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and either way is fine, but obviously this looks a little bit cleaner if you probably had to fight me. Um, so that will just read everything into the buffer. Outsize we don't need, we already made this with the right size. So it becomes a little bit simpler. All right. Um, yeah, cool. So that's that. Now let's go ahead and make sure everything else works. So this again wants a char pointer. So we can just do file data dot as char file data dot size um what else <coughs> and then same situation here buffer and see this it wants it to be a const monobyte so we can grab that and just do it as const monobyte oh, except without the pointer of course otherwise it'll be a double pointer um, and then the file size is obviously just going to be this dot size now speaking of which how do we delete it well we don't just delete it like that we call the release so see this is the thing right because it's a non-owning buffer yeah it's not a scoped kind of buffer. What we actually need to do is manually release it like this. We just have to call release at the end of the scope. Now, here's what you can do technically, right? What you can do, um, and by the way, one thing I didn't cover is what you can also do 
is you can obviously type name, like you can obviously just make this be templated and then it will just store T instead and then you don't need to go through all of this. In my experience, I don't really do that. Like I don't really care too much. I'd rather just, like at the end of the day, there's no difference, right? If you just store T like this, then there's no difference to this. There's still pointers. The The underlying type is actually identical. It's not like a vector, where if I make a vector of char versus a vector of u in 32t, they're literally different sizes, right? These are always going to be 64 size pointers. Doesn't matter if it's a u in 8t, or if you have a pointer to another buffer in here, or if you have like a string pointer, they're all 64 bytes. They're all the same thing. Sorry, 64 bytes. 8 bytes. 64 bits. Um, so... In other words, I just do that to keep it more simple because if we start actually dragging in a template into this struct itself, that means every time you create a buffer with a new type, it's going to literally copy that class and your binary size will grow and it's just unnecessary because at the end of the day, the data is the same, right? So that's why I do it that way. But, <coughs> keep coughing. But what I will say is if you did really want to, you can introduce something called like a scoped buffer. And basically what this is, is it's almost like a unique pointer in the sense that what you can do is you can have like scope, you, you can basically retain like a buffer here, right? Probably shouldn't write it like this because otherwise I think GCC will be unhappy, but you can basically have this like create a buffer. And then in here, you just call, you know, buffer.release. Right? And that's kind of, that's the idea. <laughs> uh, and in fact, what I would probably do here is, uh, I'd probably just store this like in here. Uh, and then obviously, and then we can basically wrap everything if we wanted to. So like size, we'll just do M buffer size, right? Uh, which obviously is just going to allocate because that's going to call the buffer class. Um, and then if you wanted to access data, like I guess I'd probably, you know, make it a, a function instead and buffer.data and like size. I guess we might as well implement this since we've kind of started. Um, what's your problem? All right. Missed the pointer. And what's your problem? Oh, okay. Um, and then, yeah, and then if you wanted to, you could also do everything else here, right? So the idea with this is that, um, and then of course we could still have that same templated as thing, where that's really just gonna do return buffer dot as T, right? Um, and so the idea is what you can do is uh, because, um, and then a very important thing as well is to actually have scope buffer take in a buffer instead of just a size like that. And then that will obviously, uh, like do a shallow copy essentially of the buffer. It's definitely not going to do a deep copy. So we're not going to call buffer copy like that. Um, we'll just do a normal kind of shallow copy here. But then the idea is what that means is that what you can do is you can literally just add the word scoped out the front here. This still returns a buffer, and then that means that we don't have to call release. Right? Why don't inherit? Um, no. Like, <laughs> no way. Uh, because we don't want, like, why would we do that? We'd have to, like, um, there's no reason to. And, and, like, if you want, and then we'd have to, like, set up virtual functions, probably have, like, a V table. Like, it's just way overkill. It's much better to just own it. Because this way, again, what we're doing is we're not changing the complexity of the class at all. Right? Like, it's the same thing. It's just always going to be this and this, right? If you start dealing with inheritance, it becomes very messy. And just too much overhead for no reason. This, te this technically has zero overhead. Um, Alright, so that's, that's that. And then, of course, you can still kind of do the same thing. Like, we can have a bool. Uh, and then that means that we'll just return uh, mbuffer. In fact, we can just do that. I wasn't actually planning on implementing this. I was just going to show you guys how to do it, but I guess we've done that. Um, release, we're not going to call because it's going to happen here. I mean, you can, I guess, but 
I guess I won't. And then allocate, like, I guess we can reallocate a scope buffer if we wanted to, but whatever, we won't do that for now. Um, yeah, so that's that. And then same with this, right? So you can see file data is also something that we end up actually releasing at the end of the scope, right? So instead of doing that, we could make this a scoped buffer. Now, okay, if I'm doing all of this stuff, then obviously I'm going back to like, why didn't you just use vector? Or why didn't you just, um, uh, you know, like, uh, well, yeah, like, why didn't you use vector, or why didn't you just make buffer behave like that in the first place? Because there's so many, there's so many cases in which I actually do want to pass it back and forth without having this kind of owner, ownership kind of property. Um, so that's why, like, I still want to keep that. We have to add these little parentheses because we added the, um, because these are now functions, if they're here. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, okay, so the only difference again is that like if you suddenly want it to be kind of owning and you want it to, to die at the end of the scope, then you just change buffer to be scoped buffer and that's the only reason. And if you, that, that's the only thing you need to do. And if you really want it to be completely compatible, because you can see this is now an error, because the size function, like it's not a function inside um, uh, this, you could of course just make them be like, uh, you know, the same, like we could copy this basically and put put it into here, right? Except we'd have to also change, um, would we? I don't know if we would, but yeah, you can see that now works. So we can have data like that. I don't, I feel a bit weird having, having members and functions named the same thing. <laughs> um, because of course you can address functions, so I don't even know how that works. Like, I'm surprised that compiles. Or maybe it doesn't. Yeah, it does. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, but yeah, whatever. We can think about the API in depth some other time. Okay, so there you go. Um, that's a little bit clearer. Uh, let's make sure everything still compiles over here. Okay, good. But that being said, we have made it a little bit better. However, it's still in here, right? It shouldn't be in here because why on earth would this be like inside script engine? Like obviously this is a very useful function to have in the engine. So what we're gonna do instead is move it somewhere else. So we should move it to the file system class. We don't have a file system class. So let's go ahead and um, add a new a file here called file system, namespace hazel. Now, technically speaking, this class is very platform dependent. So, uh, like, I don't really like Im implementing it here per se. Like, the, the, the thing is, the C++, the C++ API has gotten much better over the years. So, like, it supports a lot of stuff, right? Like, we can probably almost use just the C++ library itself without having to use like the Win32 API for like 95% of things we want to do. Uh, so it probably doesn't even, we probably don't even need to separate this. But basically if we were using like Win32 API things, of course like what we would do is something that is a little bit different to like what we did for like OpenGL. So in OpenGL obviously we have an implementation inside the platform directory However, it's all like a subclass of vertex buffer, um, and vertex buffer is like the platform API independent kind of agnostic, whatever you want to call it, um, like API and class that we can use, right? The reason why this, like the rendering APIs are set up like that is because we can actually compile with more than one API, right? Like you can compile with DirectX and OpenGL and you can actually let the user decide or you can, you know, you can switch at runtime, basically, what API you use. So in other words, when we distribute our game, it has both. Um, and that means that we, uh, you know, that means that we obviously need to compile both of that in. Now, with platform-related things like file system, that doesn't make sense. You can't compile a binary with both Linux and Windows support. That doesn't make sense, right? We distribute a different binary for Windows then we do for Linux, then we do for Mac, then we do for 
PlayStation or whatever, right? So because of that, uh, we don't we don't typically set up like a whole hierarchy of things like like I did. Um, someone's saying there's already a file system class. I didn't find it. There's not. Unless the master branch is different, uh, which it would be weird, but whatever. Anyway, I guess I should probably check that. Um, but anyway, so what I was saying was, uh, yeah, like what we, what we do instead is we can't just have an implementation here of a function that might be like, you know, read file. And then if we wanted a Win32 API version, what we would do is in the platform under like Windows, you know, we'd make like, um, you know, some kind of like this, for example, right? Which is clearly like a Win32 API only function. We can implement this open file thing. I mean, we've already done this with like platform utils, but we basically only compile that version of the function on Windows. And then for like Linux, we have a Linux platform utils or a POSIX platform utils or whatever, right? That has, uh, the kind of Linux API implementation implementation of that function because the idea is we only have like it can literally be an implementation of the same identical function because we only provide one implementation per configuration that we compile which is again different for the rendering APIs so we might talk about that more in depth when we start porting to like Linux and Mac and whatever um, so in platform utils uh, there's not there's no I don't know what you're talking about Unless again, master is different, but I, I don't think master is different. I'd like to view the, be good if I could view, where is this thing? Whatever. I don't really care. We can probably look at it in fork. Actually, let's look at it in fork. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, there, there is no divergence between master and scripting. You can see we're literally on the same path because there's no, there hasn't been a single commit to master since we switched to scripting. So there is no file system class. You're full of lies. Okay, so um, anyway, so, so for now we probably won't worry about this just because again, we're only really gonna use the C++, the C++ API, like the portable kind of uh, API that will work across all platforms that have like a C++ 17 plus compiler. Um, so if we go back to like script engine, then let's basically just, yeah, grab this. We'll cut it out of here. Um, we'll go back to the file system class and we'll put it here. Okay, so let's obviously implement this in a CPP file. Do we have a pre-compiled header? Yep. I don't even know. <laughs> uh, system. Um, okay, so Hazel core buffer actually this is in core. One one advantage by the way, instead of just writing buffer, if we actually were to write Hazel core buffer, the advantage is obviously if we decide to move this into like a file system folder or something, because this is like a a relative path, like this path is relative to a an actual like compiler include directory rather than to um this file, it means that if we move this file to any folder, everything will keep working. So I kind of do prefer doing this. But anyway, so there's our um, read bytes, and then here it is. Um, let's go ahead and implement that, and yeah, that's it really. So now back in our code, uh, inside file, inside script engine, we can just change this to be file system read bytes. Um, we'll include file system, of course. Um, I 
I don't know if Reed Bites is a good name. The reason why we stuck with Reed Bites is because that's what Peter wrote in his uh, mono documentation, which we kind of followed. We, we copied the first initial example from there. Um, we can probably call this like a read file binary or something, so it'll read it like as a binary file versus a read file text, which will read it like in text mode and probably return like a string. And that's probably what I would do for a name or something. I don't even know what it's called in Hazel. It might just be read file, but it's just nice to have the distinction between binary, which will return a buffer, versus like text, which might return a string. All right, does that compile? No. We forgot to change this. <sighs> All right, cool. Seems to work. Um, we had a few compiler warnings that I just want to go through. So let's see what, what we what we have here. So type cast conversion from uint to im texture id. Uh, okay. That's a bit annoying. Of greater size. So. I think the reason why it's upset is because we're doing a double conversion. So if we just do this instead, which looks ridiculous, I think it'll be happy, yeah. We probably should just make image button accept that, to be completely honest. Actually, no, that's I'm GUI's function. Sorry, I thought it was ours. Like, I thought we, I thought we wrapped it. But I don't know, I probably won't bother just because rent, like we use ways in like 32-bit OpenGL render ideas, IDs here, whereas if we switch to Vulkan, obviously that won't be the case. Okay, on key press, not all control paths, return of value, okay. Um, all right. Whew. That one can return false. I don't really want anything else to, I don't want it to block any other events. Okay, fix some warnings. Let's actually do a rebuild just so we can see if we've got any other serious warnings. <laughs> Is there any reason you haven't switched to something other than STL, maybe EASTL? Um, there just hasn't been a reason to. Like, I want to, I want us to get into, like, if we get into, I don't know why that's, oh, because of script, because of premake or whatever. Um, like, if, if there's gonna be, like, you know, like, it, I'd rather us get to the point where I can at least demonstrate to people the difference between the two. Not that I've really benchmarked them in years, but, um, it would be good to, you know, to first have a problem and then present a solution to it, rather than just presenting solutions to non-existing problems. Okay, cool. I think we're probably ready to do the merge. I mean, I'm sure there'll still be, like, you know, this is obviously, it's not like we're actually shipping this engine. So there'd be a bit more, a bit more of a rigorous QA process, process if we were. Um, but obviously it does work so far. Um, so I think we can probably safely merge this into master. I don't even know what master currently is at. Let's, let's, let's actually see. So if we just, um, go back to fork here and if we do, well, let's see what we need to commit here. Um, yes. I mean, okay. Yeah. Sure. Well, that's that doesn't really matter, does it? Okay. Uh, 
Okay. So let's push this guy. This is still going into the scripting branch. Um, and then like, let me just double check, but I'm pretty sure we can probably just delete this stuff. So this was just like, yeah. So basically let's revert everything. Um, and let's go check out master. So we're now in master. Um, let's run this, reload, yeah, so, <laughs> this is the pre, kind of, um, branch, this is master, doesn't even build, apparently, or is that not, that's not the right thing, it does build, okay, so this is what it is, so this doesn't work, um, but, yeah, okay, so we, we have no kind of, so that, okay, so, so in other words, this scene is in fact the current startup project and everything. I just wanted to make sure that we weren't completely changing everything, but we're not. So if we go back to uh, scripting, uh, and we run this, and we build, <coughs> what's up Taiwan, Taiwan? Enjoy, enjoy Big Hazel. For the rest of you, patreon.com slash the Cherno, support the series and Hazel and get access to Big Hazel and play around with it. Uh, okay, so this is kind of the, this is the kind of stuff I wanted to um, play around with. So we get a crash here. The reason why is almost definitely because it couldn't load the app assembly, right? Um, so we just, we probably should handle that in some way. And also this stuff is kind of temporary as well. But basically, uh, yeah, we definitely need to handle this. And the reason this has happened is because I reverted everything and I deleted, and I haven't built Sandbox, right? So, basically, we need to make sure that we do actually build it. Now, this stuff was, I think, for debugging, just because we couldn't view a starter, so I can get rid of this. And we can, don't, we can not worry about that. Uh, so what should happen is this load mono assembly, um, like, where does that actually happen? Like, we should probably say, so where does this get called from? Reload assembly, but also, does it init? Init mono? Because the thing is, like, when we load a project, that's ultimately when we want to load assemblies. Uh, we don't have projects yet, so that's why. Oh, it's pronounced T1. Because you're French. Okay, cool. Sorry. <laughs> Do you have any good resources or recommendations how to create an asset manager in a game engine? No. Um, I don't really have... I don't know. You can just look at, like, exist, existing documentations or, like, things like Unreal Engine. Like, even just their docs to see how it works. Uh, you don't really need to look at the code. Just look at existing, like, software, basically. See how it works, and then you can probably design some code around that. That's how I would do it. Okay, so I think we call reload somewhere. How do we load it initially? This we can delete as well. Oh, here it is, init. So init does that, so it doesn't call reload, but init does call load assembly and load app assembly. Where was that crash? in load up assembly. So yeah, so when it tries to load that. So this should work, but I guess that doesn't. So load app assembly. So let's see. So if that, we can just add some basic things here. Return bool instead, so we can return a state. Love my booleans.
Do we have tag? No, we don't have tags. I guess we're gonna just return. Okay. <clears throat> Will this ever get to 3D? No, probably not. I mean, it is, it's 2D and 3D space, but we've, we're not gonna do 3D here because it's just gonna be too much. Okay, so open scene deserialize uh, actually goes and tries to get this. So the idea is we probably want the stuff to not crash, like not, well, this is just an assert, but it's gonna crash on the next line probably. Um, because we tried to get entity class, but obviously, yeah, we return null pointer. So I guess like, you know, we could probably, put this behind an if entity class. This is why it's good to, yeah, to do this. So, right, so at the moment we're actually not loading the assembly. Yeah, could not load app assembly. Um, and we can probably print that somewhere here, but the idea is you can see it's still opened. And if I hit play, for example, right, this is another example of like, I mean, but this is more of like a, an assert, but I'm assuming it's gonna crash. Yeah, it's null pointer, because it's trying to call script instance, so. We probably don't want this to happen. Um, so s data entity instances find, and because it's gonna try and do that. We could do a else thing. Hi Trader, I'm loving ray tracing series. Here I go, like, wrote my first path tracer on CPU. Now it's time to port it on GPU. Can't wait to see how you will implement it on GPU. Sorry for bad English. Yeah, yeah, English was fine. Um, uh, yeah, I'm excited as well for that, honestly. Like, I'm trying to keep it see, as, like, I, I, I probably won't move to the GPU too soon just because it's, it's just a lot easier on the CPU. Like, the problem with moving it to the GPU is we're going to have to add a lot of, like, Vulkan code. Um, cause obviously like I, um, I want to actually use like RTX cores and stuff for that. So we're going to actually use the ray tracing pipelines. And there's, uh, it's, it's very easy. It's just a lot of boilerplate code. Um, it's so like, like at the moment it's really easy for us to focus on the way it actually works without having to be like, oh, okay guys, for the next like five episodes, we're just gonna be writing code that isn't really related to like the ray tracing algorithms. It's just us setting up what we need in Vulkan so that we can like, you know, have acceleration structures, have shaders, have like, you know, the ray tracing pipeline, have like, you know, shader binding tables and whatever else we need. Like there's a lot of stuff. And again, it's, not, it's really not hard. It's just a lot of stuff. So that's where sometimes making stuff in video format is a bit annoying. Although, I don't know, maybe I'll just be like, just download my code that I already wrote for you guys and we can, that way we can actually focus on the contents of the shaders rather than how to load shaders. So yeah, we'll see. All right, cool. So you can see this works. We can't control our character, obviously. Uh, and we get this kind of could not find script instance. So it's pretty obvious that something's not working because we haven't loaded our app assembly, but we don't crash and that's important. We need some kind of way to display message boxes probably because it's a pretty serious error if you can't load your app assembly. But the solution obviously is just to go into sandbox. Um, oh, sorry, go into, yeah, wasn't it supposed to be? Oh no, that's the wrong sandbox. Go into hazelnut sandbox project. Um, 
uh, open up the solution. Build this. And now we can launch this. And now we shouldn't get the could not load uh, app assembly. And if we, well, we can keep this running, we can hit play. And you can see now we don't get any errors. And now we can control our character, right? So, um, our character, our cube. It's not even a cube, our square. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there we go. So that's just something I wanted to verify. Um, so let's go ahead and just commit that basically. Uh, this is annoying because we shifted it. Uh, that's all right though. Uh, okay, and now um, what we can do is we can just check out master uh, We can just do um, Merge into we can right click on scripting over here, which is all the way ahead here And we can just do merge into master right and of course there's no conflicts because it's just a fast forward basically It's just a it's just that um, And yeah, that's it. It's not really even a commit or anything. It's just that and then we can um, this is just all rubbish. We can just do a little push and just like that we have merged the scripting branch into master Congratulations everyone big moment Take a look at hazel You can see we're in master and all of this stuff is now in here, right? Because we've merged it into master and we could now delete the scripting branch and if you actually look at the commit history You can see like it's kind of like it's all here, right? So scripting has actually all these commits, but you can see that if we're on the master branch, it's not like we have a one commit, like a squashed commit that's just like merged into master. It's no, it's everything is here, right? Because of the way that we kind of merged it. I probably should have showed you guys other ways to merge it, but I obviously want that because I want it, I want it to almost look like every individual commit was done in master without it actually having been done in master during development. And that's what we can do just by like fast forwarding like that. Um, rather than like, I mean, this is, this is up to date, but so you can also do like a squash merge, uh, and you can create a merge commit. Um, I don't know. I don't know what merge without commit is, but there's a few, there's a few different options. All right, that's it. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to go ahead and, uh, grab the master branch of Hazel 2D and test it. Now you will have to build sandbox. Otherwise it won't work properly. So in other words, you'll have to go into like hazelnut slash sandbox project slash like assets slash scripts slash sandbox dot solution. Open it, build it. Once you've generated projects, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah. Everything. Uh, so once you build a sandbox project, everything should probably work as expected. So yeah. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Those of you on YouTube, uh, leave a like, please. Helps the series out. <laughs> Those of you on Twitch, I don't know what to tell you. Um, yeah, next time I guess we're gonna start working on. Oh yeah, the project system. So basically, we want we want to be able to have like different projects which are going to like contextually contain like the assets relating to the project including like the scripts and like the the actual c sharp assembly as well can we access the twitch fod yes you can all right thank you guys for watching i'll see you next time goodbye